Professor Brian Brown's research shows that vulnerability fosters good emotional and mental health. It is a sign of courage. We become more resilient and brave when we embrace who we truly are and what we are feeling. The Vulnerable Scientist Podcast is a space for scientists to tell their honest and authentic stories. I am your host, Saranya Kerry, who happens to be a scientist, informal science communicator, and I help scientists create personal websites. If you want to support this show, go to www.patreon.com slash the vulnerable scientist. You can also follow this podcast on all social media platforms at TV Scientist Pod. So Take me through just a brief, because I'm imagining mm. in your book, that's what you've talked about a lot, like in depth. Mm. But take me through briefly through your PhD um, mm. and you getting an opportunity. Like take me through in terms of uh, to where you are right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. So in summary, uh, I'll I'll give you a summary and then I can give you. I like I like giving my story through through learned learned lessons or pieces of advice. Mm. Looking back, okay. but in summary, my PhD was at the University of Oxford mm. for four years, from October twenty fifteen, and I defended my thesis in twenty nineteen December, mm. and officially was given was given the uh, I'm actually graduating next this month mm. but like I was I passed all the requirements on February of 2020 mm. and then I I wanted to and then corona happened mm. but I wanted I really wanted to graduate in person so I mm. I, I I put myself on a waiting list so I'm mm. actually graduating on May mm. May 20 May 21 2020 mm. but uh, that's so I, that's that's my PhD and my PhD was investigating better coding technologies for aircraft engines and then after that four years, I, I got a fellowship mm. to come here to the U.S. to mm. try and research something different. So that's the summary. But if I was to look back, and I think, like you mentioned, I mm. actually wrote almost all my all the stories that I remember in the mm. book. And the mm. book is The PhD Journey, Strategies mm. for Enrolling, Thriving, and Excelling in a PhD Program. If I was to if I was to sum, so the top three pieces of advice, and especially for someone, and mostly I'm kind of talking to myself actually in 2014 when I had gotten the, the Rhodes Scholarship, mm. and I was now thinking about actually, so you get the Rhodes Scholarship and then you 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 apply for admission. Mm. So when I look back to 2014 after getting the scholarship and I was planning or in the process of enrolling. Mm. And then all the way to process of surviving and thriving. So I survived my PhD in the first few years, and then I was thriving towards mm. the end of it. Mm. And then um, I, I think I, you know, now looking back, I think I excelled, uh, considering where I was coming from. So I can confidently say, I, I in my own um, judgment, I did it well. Mm. So I give a lot of advice there and all the stories that I can think of. But if I was to summarize the top three, mm. number one is inspiration is perishable. Mm. And I'll go into some details about that. Mm. And then number two is there is a companion. For for someone going into this research, there is a companion you need to know. The earlier, the better. And the companion is imposter syndrome. So that's number two lesson. Mm-hmm. If I had known, if I had known more about this, this companion, I think it would have been better. Uh, or at least I would have prepared to embrace and coexist with my companion throughout my PhD. Mm. Number three is, our 30th, 40th, 50th birthdays are not promised. And I'm, I'm, I'll just give you like a brief, brief uh, reasons why uh, or, or, or discussion on all, on all this. So the first one is inspiration is perishable. Mm. And it took me very long time to realize this. And the, 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 so the, this inspiration is perishable. It's a, it's, a, it's a conclusion name. So there is this book, it's called... The book is Rework, Rework, R-E-W-O-R-K, Rework. Mm. And, and the, the authors are giving us insightful suggestions on how we can improve the way we work, how to improve our productivity, et cetera. Mm. But the, the the conclusion of their book, it's, it's I've, I've never forgotten to this day. I don't know. I read the book, I think, in 2018. And the conclusion of their book is Inspiration is Perishable. 
and I loved it. I loved it. So anyway, so they, they, they suggest, so when mm. they were writing Inspiration is Perishable, they mm. suggest that w- once you get inspiration to do something, and I know even you, you can tell Sarah, like when you got an inspiration to do a podcast, and I don't know for you if it was like just a automatic thing, like you got the inspiration and you did it, mm. or you sometimes you get the inspiration and if you wait for too long, the inspiration goes. Because. Yes. So so the, the, the reason I'm, I'm going to tie back to my PhD mm. and there were so many days, like I would get an inspiration to, to to design some kind of experiment or to recite something. And then if you leave it for too long or if you don't commit yourself to doing stretching your PhD or your research. And, and I, I think Sorry, also you got lost for a while. Gladys. Oh, you, you got lost for a right. while. So you, you, where you're talking about inspiration. So inspiration is perishable. So you have an idea to do an experiment. Then from there you got lost. Oh, so if you have an idea to to do an experiment mm-hmm. or to write a research paper mm-hmm. or any idea, it could even be something outside your PhD. Mm-hmm. Once the inspiration comes, you have to use. You have to act immediately. If you wait one day, two days, one week, it will go. Mm-hmm. And also, and, and, and I think I think this is even outside our research lives, right? Like you get an inspiration to do something, mm. but you are like, let me wait. Let me just wait to, to get everything 100%. By the time you get all the materials, the inspiration is gone. Mm. And that's how you lose on opportunities. And I wish I had learned, I wish I had known this way early in, in, in my life because I feel like I would have taken so many opportunities because I feel like I waited too long and and so some things I lost motivation and, and that's just how the dream went. And also, mm. I, th- I think connected to this inspiration is perishable. And it's really, this is really important to someone doing a long research. Mm. Could be master's, it could be a PhD. It could mm. be anything else. Even when I was writing this book, I think writing the book, it took me like two years. Uh, mm. Writing uh, bits by bits. Mm. So it's a long project. So anyone doing a long project, mm. there is something about, so once you have the inspiration, there is also something that can kill the inspiration. And if we wait, if we, so we, we do tend, so we, we do tend to get stuck, especially if the project is too, too big. Mm. So you get stuck um, trying to analyze, trying to, to, to over plan. And then you are waiting to be hundred percent or even 110% uh, mm. bef- before you, bef- you ready, before you, you make the next step. Right. Mm. Yeah. And then uh, I remember there was there was this particular conference paper that I I spent sleepless nights so many of them trying to perfect it, and and then I I handed it to my advisor for 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 him to check before I submitted. Mm. The paper came back and it had every paragraph had like major corrections. Mm. Red red you know? red. And I I was just looking back. Red red red. And I was like I wish I had just spent two days mm. and then get the correction, correct the thing, and move on. Mm-hmm. And I think the lesson, the lesson that I learned, and I think it's really important for someone doing a, lo- a long research, is mm-hmm. to stop over analyzing. And mm-hmm. then um, uh, James Clear, this author of, I, I'm sure you've heard about or you've, you've read Atomic Habits, mm-hmm. and he 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 puts forward an idea of fail fast. You try, you fail, you learn, you try differently, and you move on. Mm. And w- when I look back, when I look back, I think I wasted too much time of analyzing, over preparing, waiting to be under the ten percent before I made the move. Mm. So, inspiration is perishable, and and if you're doing a long project like a PhD, like a long master's, anything else that is long, mm. fail fast, just try, mm. fail, mm. learn, try mm. differently, and mm. and let the ball keep rolling. That's number one. Okay. Uh, and I'm I'm trying to summarize. So all these three topics are like top three ad- pieces of advice from my journey, mm. my PhD j- journey to where I am now. Mm. Number two is this companion called imposter syndrome. And I'm telling you, Sarah, I, I moved from JQuart is rank number in 2015. I think it was rank number 2,600 in the World University rankings. Mm-hmm. I was moving from an undergrad from JQuart, and I was putting myself. I was I was going to do a PhD at the University of Oxford, which I think was ranked number one at that time. Oh, to wow. tell you I was scared is, I think that's an understatement. Like I was beyond scared, right? And I think if I had, 
And for a very long time, especially the first few years, and I, I, I chose the word survived. I survived in the first, uh, I, 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 thriving was not in, in, in the, I, I didn't thrive, I was surviving in the first few months, in the first years of my PhD, because the environment itself is so intimidating. And, and then I was, and, and then I was, I, was uh, I, I barely had any research skills. So I was learning so many things mm-hmm. afresh. I was starting from, I like to say I was starting from negative side of the scale. But anyway, one thing if, if I had known and if someone had told me earlier, I think it would have helped me in dealing with impo- in imposter syndrome, I think, is that it, it wasn't me. It wasn't necessarily me. It, was, it wasn't necessarily because of my abilities that mm-hmm. I, I felt insecure. It was mostly because of the process, of the process and the nature of learning, nature of growth. And I don't know if you've heard about Abraham Maslow, four stages of learning. It, this is something that I learned way later. Mm-hmm. And now when I'm taking on a project, the imposter syndrome no longer hinder me because I know it's not me. It's not my abilities. It's the process. So mm-hmm. this is the process, four stages of learning. The first stage in the four stages of learning mm-hmm. is unconscious incompetence. You know, when someone, sometimes when someone is debating a topic, they are not they are not familiar with like for someone who is familiar in that topic you're like what is this person talking about Mm. they have no single idea so that's unconscious incompetence like you don't know that Mm. you don't know Mm. (laughs) that Mm. someone would say you are stupid Mm. and the the, the reason why someone would say you are stupid is because they know more than you know Mm. and i think this is where if i was to give an example this is where i was when i was starting my phd I do not know that I do not know. Like this, you just you just blank. Uh, you are just young in the process. And number two, mm-hmm. you start going to conscious incompetence, mm-hmm. and now this is where the imposter syndrome will come in. Because now you begin, you yeah, you are now aware of what you don't know, and it is paralyzing. Because mm-hmm. you know, you know there is so much to be learned, mm-hmm. and you and you realize you have you, you know one percent of it, and and this is where you you get a great deal of insecurities and self-doubt and and imposter syndrome. Mm. And this is where I I feel like this is where I stayed for a a period of time. I would say from first year, maybe to third year of my PhD or maybe to second year, end of second year of my PhD. And then there is the conscious competence. So now now that that you know that you don't know, you you make plans to learn, to read more, to experiment, to all those things. And then you learn. And then it gets to a point. Actually, the the fourth stage now, the fourth fourth stage is is you are. It's called unconscious competence. You you even forget that you know, right? And that's why I feel like when you at the end of your master's or PhD, when you are when you are explaining your 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 project, you're using jargon. You're using you you think that everyone should know this thing, mm. and you are super surprised when someone tells you, "Please explain," and you're like, "You." guys don't know this thing mm. but for you it's become unconscious you you know and you even forget that you know mm. but for someone else people will lose you because they don't understand so anyway just to say uh don't let imposter syndrome will come and i think research has been done and, and imposter syndrome impacts more than 70 percent of the people even maya angela like mm. the the greatest uh, of, of you know the greatest writer's poet and, and she talks about how imposter syndrome affected her and every Mm. time she released a book she thought people will maybe people will now realize that i don't know something Mm. like that Mm. so i just advice there is expect that imposter syndrome will come Mm. Uh, the longer the project um the more and it's really especially at the beginning stages of the learning process Mm. but don't let it hinder you understand that imposter syndrome is as a result of learning it it is a result of growth in the process in the learning process mm. and keep pushing forward regardless of it and there is this quote that i like quoting and it says everything you, you you've ever wanted is sitting on the other side of fear mm. so if you let imposter syndrome hinder you you will never get to those nice things on the other side of fear mm. last one is your 30th 40th 50th etc but these are not promised so something happened while i was doing my phd that Mm. changed my life Mm. and the reason i've written those two books the reason i'm now experimenting with business ideas the reason now i am doing all these things is because of what happened in 2017 
July of 2017. What happened? What happened? I'll get to it in a few. Mm. And actually, the last this book that I wrote, the PhD journey, mm. it would not have happened if it wasn't for what happened in July of 2017. And I dedicate it to my brother, my late brother Josh, because that's the reason. It's mourning the the death of my brother is what unlocked something in me. So I'll give you a story. So Josh is our was our firstborn, mm-hmm. and we lost him in July of 2017. Mm-hmm. It was a devastating loss. It was the first closest member of my immediate family to lose, and and the and the the loss was was the loss was so so hard. Like it was so hard to to go through it. But after after going through mourning and making peace with the, with his loss, mm. something in me something in me changed, and then I just just the real and raw realization mm. that we are mortal and we 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 can die any time, mm. and and, and mo- mostly because so Josh after he graduated from college he did pharmacy. He's one of the brothers who influenced me uh, into Great STEM. STEM. Mm. He, yeah, he did struggle to get a, a good job, but after after a few he after a few years, he he did get one, and he was able to provide well for his family and 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 his life and his family's life was going well. And then during this time, uh, especially towards the end of his life, he would be t- he would he would tell us about big dreams like bold dreams that he was planning he was planning to do he was planning to make all these investments and um, that he, he would um, that would earn him a good uh, income and he would retire in his 40s and he would do all these all these all these all these i mean he was focused dedicated go-getter and i knew he would all those things would come to pass right and then mm. July 2017, he um, he passed away, and I was I was at Oxford at that time, and my housemates broke the news, and I was devastated. I flew home a few days later, and uh, during his funeral, as he was being lowered down inch by inch to the grave, mm. I think uh, like all the dreams that he used to tell us, because they were really vivid. He had a, a an, he had a talent, a natural talent of telling stories. And I still remember some of the stories about his dreams that he told us. And I remember on that day, I just realized a painful realization that I was not only mourning the death of my brother, but also mm-hmm. mourning astoundingly bold dreams that he that never saw the light of day that people didn't get to experience, that mm-hmm. the world missed on. And then I think that raw and real realization that our... 30th, our 40th, our 50th birthdays are never guaranteed. They are mm. never promised. That scared me. And then I began I began to appreciate life more. I made a conscious decision to start working on realizing my dreams one at a time, as early as possible, whenever possible. <laughs> and anyway, it's a reason why I became obsessed with trying to achieve those dreams. And mm. I don't think I've, I, I told you I had 45% percent in English in KCP I've mm. never considered myself an author but just thinking that I will die with my dreams with my stories mm. it scares the hell out of me and it's changed my life as a result like his loss has changed my life as a result and I just want to say I know we were talking about research in this in this episode but mm. it's just a wisdom uh, a small wisdom that a uh, wise thing that has come in my system and it's changed me it's just to remind um, anyone listening that whatever you whatever you really want to achieve in your life uh, the legacy you want to leave mm. it, it's not too late to start or it's not too early actually mm. it's not too early to start uh, business uh, anything anything writing books any any passion of yours mm. as early as possible whenever possible just start doing it because the future is not promised and that's 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 the end of uh, three main uh, themes I would say that that kind of summarize my PhD journey mm. and uh, where I am. Wow! Thanks for sharing that. This is a the vulnerable scientist podcast where we talk about everything that surrounds a scientist's life. It's not the science, really. 
okay mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> um i don't know you've mentioned something to do with uh before we go to the highs and lows uh, mm-hmm. uh, as much as you've already mentioned them just uh, more that you haven't talked about but before we go to that can we talk about Do you want to learn about the strategies for enrolling, thriving and excelling in a PhD program? Dr. Gladys Ngetich has written a book on the PhD journey with lessons from various PhD students across the globe and from her lessons as a ex-Oxford PhD student. Dr. Gladys is now a postdoc researcher at MIT. For you to get a chance to get a free book, post your favorite podcast episode of the Vulnerable Scientist podcast on any social media account and tag the Vulnerable Scientist social media account with the hashtag the Vulnerable Scientist book giveaway. You can now pre-order the book on Amazon or as an ebook on Kindle Cobol Dalia ETC. You can get more information on this book on www.gladischepkirui.com/books. Mm-hmm. 